So we're meeting today to talk to Daniel Arbon from Middle Realm Productions about his new independent film, Hawker, which tells the story of Britain's first fighter ace, Lano Hawker. Also present are Peter Dye, who's the president of the Great War Aviation Society, Derek Davis and myself, Nicole Greenslade, and we are members of the Great War Aviation Society, which is a historical society specialising in World War I aviation. We want to talk to Daniel and Peter about Lano Hawker's story and what it's been like to make the film about him. As well as producing the film, Daniel also appears in it as a character called Lieutenant Colonel Charles Burke, and he even built many of the sets himself. As Daniel says, it's been a labour of love for the past few years. Hi, Daniel um, and Hi. Peter. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to talk to us about this uh, upcoming film on Lano Hawker. Um, before we get into detail, of the film. Peter, can you tell us a little bit about Lana Hawker? Um, who was he and why does he matter? Well, uh, Lano was, I think it'd be fair to say, the, the first British uh, fighter pilot in that he was as an ace. He shot down more than three aircraft. And when he did so, uh, it was unprecedented in the sense that uh, air warfare in the early years of the First World War was very much about aircraft uh, undertaking reconnaissance and perhaps bombing missions. But air fighting was a novelty and it never really uh, progressed very far while people were using um, rifles or pistols to shoot each other. So Lano really was the, the man who broke that mould uh, and in shooting down three uh, enemy aircraft on one day, he effectively started the, the world of Top Gun, you know, the world that we now recognise. Uh, but we have to remember that um, in 1915, this was um, unprecedented. And it's uh, with the eyes of those who were, uh, you know, uh, at the living at the time that I think we have to, to understand his achievements. Uh, three aircraft in one day has been matched by other aces subsequently, and, and some have achieved even more victories in a single day. But three aircraft shot down in one day was uh, an exceptional, um, sorry, was exceptional, unexpected, and in fact, inspiring. And so Lano not only is the first fighter ace, but also an inspirational leader for the Royal Flying Corps and ultimately the Royal Air Force. Right, okay. And I'm assuming in, back in those days, in the early days of World War One, it was actually harder to shoot down an aircraft because technology well, and everything else and, and experience. Yes, um, and um, it, 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 again, it's, it's one of those um, innovations that in retrospect sounds entirely sensible and predictable, but it certainly wasn't at the time. No. The idea that, you know, that, that uh, airmen would fight each other in the sky, um, high above the trenches, was exceptional. It was just not something that people comprehended. And mm. when he did so, uh, he, was, um, he became a national hero. Turn to you, Daniel. How did you become interested specifically in Lano Hawker and what makes his story so special to you? Um, I, I think the thing, yeah, I actually stumbled across Lano Hawker. Um, I, have, I have to admit that I, um, I, I've always had a, an, in, an interest in aviation combat, but uh, never, never particularly deep. Um, and and I actually stumbled across the story of Lano Hawker filming my last film, which was called White Feather. Um, that that film was a film that I made about my grandfather, who was a conscientious objector in the First World War. And my my film is basically about him being given a feather, which was uh, which was this symbol of cowardice. Um, but the the interesting thing was that. Um, in, in researching the white feather treatment that they called it, uh, there was a chapter in the book about um, famously Lano Hawker was mm -hmm. mistakenly given a white feather when I think he was he was back in England um, to receive his Victoria Cross and he, he was out in mufti dress and um, and a girl gave him a white feather as a coward, uh, which of course he. <laughs> He, he was um he thought it, the irony was brilliant and thought it was absolutely hilarious and uh, but, but that um that story made a chapter in the book and and i i read that story and um and thought oh i've, I, I've not I put my hands up and say i haven't heard of this <laughs> i haven't heard of this guy and um i i ended up going 
I, I sometimes call it a, a, a Wikipedia rabbit hole, uh, where you where you where you go on one page and then you click on another link, and and suddenly several hours have passed, and you've been thoroughly you know, like, how did I get here? Yeah. And, uh, and and it was really it was it was an it was a a lack of it was a gap in my knowledge of uh, World War One aviation history that really um, really inspired me and and really surprised me because. As, as as Peter has said as well, I I I had never thought about the difficulty of firing through a propeller arc. So when when people were writing saying Lano Hawker attached um, a Lewis gun to the side of his machine to avoid the propeller, it suddenly thought I thought I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. I I'd, I'd, I'd always just thought yeah they fired straight forward. But that I'd never thought about this whole need for a synchronized. So, so that that got that got my um, my brain going. Oh, that's something I I didn't know, and 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 started going. And the more I the more I read about Lano Hawker, the more I really um, I really started to like this character. And mm-hmm. and as Peter said, th- he, this was the this was the genesis. This was a tipping point of um, of aviation history. Mm-hmm. And um, and and as a filmmaker and somebody who likes drama, I love I love that side of things that, that mm-hmm. this is a turning point, a moment in history. Mm-hmm. So that really appealed to me. Yeah. Yeah. Now I can empathize with a lot of what you just said there, actually, um, particularly where you go into a subject and then you end up. I think that's how I got into First World War, you know, a visit to the Imperial War Museum mm-hmm. just as a day out. And then I picked up this book on World War One. And it was a little paperback, and then you just go down, like you say, a rabbit hole. You know? mm-hmm. so, and it was yeah. interesting because I think naturally, what what you then do is is you is you think, oh, I'd love to see a great film on, that's got Lana Hawker in it, and yeah. and and suddenly it's like, oh, there isn't really one. <laughs> and then yeah. you're like, well, I'd love to see a a, a great World War One aviation film, and and yeah. and that was when I realised that there's actually not a lot of films <laughs> on the subject no. and certainly no. not recently and no. um, so that again got got the, the this crazy idea in my brain as like yeah. wow well, oh maybe there's maybe there's something i could do here oh, well, um, having an interest in a particular pilot is one thing but deciding to take on the challenge of making a film about that individual is another so why did you decide to make a film about hawker uh, and could you give us an outline of the film yeah, I mean, I think that carries on from what from what I was saying um, yeah. previously. I think um, I, I love the I love the Genesis story. I loved that that point of of the pivotal moment. But I think there was a, a lot of other reasons that that kind of drew me to to Lano rather than than somebody with higher higher kill count later on in the war. And, and I think it was. Yeah, there's there's a number of reasons. I think as a as a filmmaker, I'm particularly interested in in an interesting lead character. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think when I when I had read the book on, on Lano Hawker, I realised that not only was he a a brilliant pilot, but like Peter said, he's he was also a phenomenal leader. Um, he was a great inventor, and he was also a phenomenally complex character and i think when you when you put all of those things together for a lead character i thought this is this is somebody who can hold a film um as as a character as a lead um and i think when when the ideas really started going in my mind i ultimately had the the end goal vision that i would also like to write a a full length um film uh, a full-length feature film um that, that, that covers the whole story mm-hmm. and uh, and when i put that in i said lano is a he is a wonderful mm-hmm. character that mm-hmm. i think can hold a very very good story mm-hmm. um and can hold a full feature length story because of the quality mm-hmm. <laughs> of the material that he gives as a character and yeah. his story yeah. so from from that i then um thought well i'm i'm not i can't make a, a feature film straight away so what i want to do is i make a a short film um to kind of as a proof of concept of what what we could have with a, a feature uh but i was looking for a, a a short 
story. So narrowed it down to to the events of of July twenty fifth and and his Victoria Cross winning, right? Really, because it's it's a self contained short story that that could work that I could do within a, a yeah. very very small budget. Yeah. Um. So that's that's really uh, what what our story is on. It's, so we we take it. We take it, we, we condense a little bit of time, but it's all very much centered on that one day. Mm-hmm. Um, so our, our film starts at, at the end where, and the end of the day where um, he goes out to the trenches to, to visit the crash site of, of one of the German machines that he shot down and, and he finds the Iron Cross of the, of the pilot. And, um, and I, for me, I think that that's a, a quite a, emotive mm. point and symbolic of 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 the change that has happened in aviation so so we have that really poignant moment where in many ways i i feel that i don't know did did he see his own future kind of foreshadowed in in this event and the future of so many pilots from this point onwards because from this point onwards it's got a lot more serious we now have fighter pilots mm-hmm um um so and then he goes back we we then go back and to earlier in that day and and all of the events that led up to that combat uh which is which is that makes up the rest of the film and then we that we end up back in the trenches and ultimately he's there with the decision he's looking at he's looking at his own future in this iron cross like what what do we do now like what is mm. what is this new world that yeah. we're existing in and and what does what does he find as a character is the motivation for him to yeah. uh, go on and continue in this course yeah fascinating no that's um yeah and particularly that day you at least you've got a beginning the middle and an end just choosing that particular day in telling the story you know it's a microcosm of a, of the whole context but at least it it kind of encapsulates what's what's going on around the battle area as well really doesn't it so yeah question for um for peter i think okay so we talked we talked a little bit about the film focusing on this pivotal moment in the war where pilots move from reconnaissance to to fighter pilots was was lano hawker the very first pilot to make that connection or were there other people doing it at the same time um, no, he was he was one of a, of a number uh, of pilots in in all the air services, German, French, and British, who who understood that fighting in the air was inevitable um, if you wanted to achieve air superiority. And air superiority was essential to uh, controlling artillery fire. Uh, so it was it was. It was all part of uh, how you break the stranglehold of French warfare, <clears throat> which took several years to achieve and uh, demanded changes both on the ground and the air. But he was very much uh, the pioneer in the British air services. Uh, and once he demonstrated that you could fight successfully in the air, uh, that it wasn't just a matter of passing the enemy uh, as he flew by you in the opposite direction and waving to him, that actually you could engage. That that transformed uh, air warfare on the on the Western Front and ultimately contributed to the Allied victory because uh, Lano really was the, the 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 leading edge of a transformation that the Royal Flying Corps uh, was perhaps the leading exponent of, and it was Lano later on who made a very significant contribution to what we now understand as air power mm. so that's that leads me on to my next question what happened after that point so daniel describes this incredible day and you know finishing with with sort of this decision ahead of him or look, looking at the iron cross and thinking what does my future hold mm. what, ha- what happened to him well he uh, he continued scoring aerial victories and at the end of the year, with seven um, um, combat uh, successes to his name, he returned to England, where he was selected to command the first dedicated British fighter squadron. 
equipped with the DH2 pusher uh, machine, the de Havilland DH2. And this resolved the issue of uh, firing through the propeller arc by placing the engine and the propeller behind the pilot. So uh, it was a single seat machine uh, with a single machine gun um, in the front nacelle. And that obviated any need for synchronization uh, gear or indeed um, having to fire offset to the direction of flight. So um, Mano Walker uh, led and built up this first squadron and brought it out to France, where it immediately had an effect. It, it actually um, uh, resolved the what was called the Fokker Scorch, where the, the Germans had, uh, as part of this sort of iterative process of technology innovation, uh, they had introduced uh, monoplanes firing a, a machine gun through the propeller arc, through synchronization that effectively interrupted the, the machine gun fire when the propeller passed in front of the, uh, of the gun. Uh, and this uh, gave the Germans a, a huge advantage in the first few months of um, uh, 1915 sorry, 1916, and, and uh, the introduction of the DH-2 dedicated uh, fighter squadron um, actually uh, re re resolved that in, that imbalance, and the Royal Flying Corps was able to assert air superiority again. Um, but Lano, in forming that squadron, uh, demonstrated uh, outstanding leadership. Uh, it was a concept that was untested, a large group of uh, machines flying together in formation, uh, attacking the enemy. Uh, and that became the model for air warfare thereafter. It's the mm. model that we recognize through the Second World War and until mm. this very day. Mm. Uh, so he was part of that revolution, uh, the first fighter squadron commander, the first fighter pilot really in the Royal Air Force. And that formed part of the, the Royal Flying Corps um, strategy in 1916 during the Battle of the Somme. Mm -hmm. uh, which was so successful that it transformed the German air service who had to reorganize because Trenchard realized that um, air power was about not just capability, but concentration uh, over, uh, over a wide area. And the Royal Flying Corps uh, won the Battle of the Somme in the air. The, the, the results on the ground were, let's say, you know, uh, dire uh, for mm -hmm. the many thousands that lost their lives. But in the air, the German Air Service was driven out of the sky and the Royal Flying Corps achieved air supremacy as opposed to superiority and was mm. able to conduct its air operations in support of the ground offensive without any uh, hindrance, such that the German army wondered where their air service was. Mm. Uh, and this, in, in turn, triggered a whole reorganization of the, uh, the German Air Service, and they started assembling their own fighter squadrons, the Jagdstaffel. Uh, and it was a pilot in one of those early uh, units, uh, Manfred von Richthofen, who shot down Lano Hawker in combat. Because by the autumn of 1916, the Germans had much better aircraft than the British. It was this sort of constant process of innovation and um, uh, and replacement that actually saw the the sort of the 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 um, the advantage swing from one side to the other. And whereas the DH-2 flown by Lano Hawker in the early part of 1916 was hugely successful and much superior to the German uh, machines, by the autumn of 1916, it was inferior. Mm -hmm. And Lano knew this, but he felt it was important that his squadron continued to contest um, air superiority with the Germans. And it was flying one of those missions that he met his end mm -hmm. at the hands of the man who would become the highest scoring fighter race of the First World War. Mm. Uh, so I think it'd be fair to say he met his match, but Lano's inspiration continued to motivate the Royal Flying Corps and ultimately the Royal Air Force for the remainder of the war. Mm. It's interesting to listen to you there, Peter, because uh, people that are into World War I uh, or <clears throat> um, air warfare in general always looked to Oswald Bulker as being the kind of the father of air combat. But listening to you there, actually, Nano Hawker is just as important, if not more important to a certain degree, given his influence within the Royal Flying Corps. Yes. I mean, Bulker's, Bulker's influence on the German air service was a direct result of the um, 
the, their failure during the Battle of the Somme to protect mm -hmm. their, their troops. Mm -hmm. And Volker came up with the answer to the Royal Flying Corps' uh, offensive strategy, mm -hmm. uh, of which Nano Hawker was part. And in mm -hmm. a way, Volker uh, reinvented for the German Air Service the strategy that Lano Hawker had initiated for the Royal Flying Corps. Yeah. But I would point out that each side uh, in this sort of process of uh, invention and reinvention uh, mm. could, I think, fairly claim to have made significant contributions to the whole process. Yeah. But yes, Lano Hawker preceded Volker and in mm. a way um, sort of... Um, gave Bolker the platform that he needed yeah. to argue as a junior officer yeah. for significant changes in the way that the German air service was organized. Yeah. The film itself, I think, is 23 minutes, isn't it? Which is quite short for a film. How, how long did it take you to, to create that 23 minute piece? <laughs> <laughs> a long time. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, I don't want to think of it as how long it took per minute of film, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's 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 been a project of me for for around about well over three years now. Um, I have to say it hasn't been full time because I I also have to work, um, but it's 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 been it's been something I've been working on. Um, fairly solidly it has been has been my passion for for the last three years um it's been it it was um it took about a year of development uh i, I needed to b before i because i crowdfunded the film um and before i got to that point i had to i, I realized i had to convince people that i wasn't um, just, just um, trying to attempt something that I, I couldn't do. And I think before that moment, I had to convince myself that I <laughs> wasn't trying to attempt something that I couldn't manage. So it, it did take quite a lot of uh, development before I went public with the whole thing. Um, so when, once I went public and, 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 and started on the, the crowdfunder, I think that was around about two years ago. So um, we, shot, we shot the majority of our footage in... Um, in 2022 and then this this year 2023 has has mostly been um editing and, and visual effects and music and all of that all, all of the finishing up right well for, which follows on actually segues quite nicely how did you film the flight sequences <laughs> well yeah th and this and this was the big question when that i had to ask myself when uh, when I came up with the idea, is like, what do I do about the aerial sequences? Because the ground footage is fine. That's that's that. Well, it's not simple because it's still period, but it's. I, I was fully aware of what I could do with that, but I had to convince. I had to work out a way of 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 pulling together an aerial sequence, and I think the the biggest key for that was having a real plane. Um, so uh, once once I'd kind of identified um what i could do with the other areas it was really a case of of trying to secure um somebody who wanted uh to, to fly for us and and that came in the form of david bremner um who was just a massive massive help to this i mean i would go to the point of saying we could not have made this film without david's um help because because he has a a, a, a wonderful Bristol Scout replica, and because he's been so invested in the project, and like as soon as I called him up, he was like, "Yes, yes, yes, tell yeah. me more. Like, what, what, what can I do to help?" He he was so positive with it, and 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 I've got so much to thank for him. So so having having that as a real footage is is the is the vast majority of of our flying. Um, the the next the next big thing uh, was I needed. I needed a cockpit for close-ups. Um, and if you actually look behind me, that's what, what you'll see here. Uh, so I spent, uh, b before I'd gone public, I, I spent quite a bit of time um, building this, this cockpit replica that, that, that's able to move on, on three axes that we can, we can actually stage that, get the camera up close right into the actor's face and, and get those close-up shots. And and then and then the big question was well what do we do with the with the wider angles and 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 actually seeing the planes including the Germans, um, 
and and that was when it came down to it was a mixture of miniatures and um and visual visual effect <laughs> um cgi um because the 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 thing about the, the the german machines is that they were albatross type c's of which as far as i'm aware and what i could find at the time there are no flying replicas so there was there was no one like david i could approach for the german machines uh, unless i wanted to go down the route of using the wrong machines which was not something i wanted to do uh, because historical accuracy is, is very important to a lot of people and it's important mm. to me so mm. really it was just the option of of miniatures and and cgi so i spent a lot of time with with the models kind of flying models against green screen at, at like real old school kind of like George Lucas Star Wars kind of uh, of style. Uh, and then a mixture of that kind of evolved into using a lot more CGI in the latter stages of the film. So I got funny on from what I've listened. How long did it take you to build that cockpit? Uh, it, it was on and off. I, I seem to remember it was um it was probably two, three weeks, but it has evolved. Uh it has evolved a lot. Uh, uh -huh. kept, kept going the um the 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 mount because uh, i built the gun as well um uh -huh. that, that that probably took a couple of weeks uh to get good but the um the, the hawker mount itself was was quite a lot of experimentation as well so in in general yeah it, I, like i say i i, I wouldn't want to put <laughs> i wouldn't want to uh, put a figure on how many um hours i spent uh, making these things that's convincing. Who made the models used in the film? Uh, me again. <laughs> oh well, you're um, a model maker as well. Well, uh, the, the the models I've I've made a number of um, I've made a number of plastic models, uh, especially as a kid. So uh, the German the German plane was available. Uh, Wingnut Wings made a uh, they, they didn't make a a C one Albatross, which is what I needed, but mm -hmm. the closest. That they did that I could find in a larger format was the Albatross B2, which is actually as similar as mm -hmm. you can find to. So there was a little bit of of changing it up just to try to make it a little bit more similar to the C1. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but that was that was straightforward. The, the the Bristol Scout was a bit more difficult because at the time I couldn't find any large format um, plastic models. Uh, mm -hmm. They have since brought one out. Um, I think Copper State Models have brought out a, That's a right. lovely. There you go. Yeah, there we go. I'm not sure you'll be able to see that. My camera won't pick that up. But there you go. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> believe me. They've yeah. got a lovely 32 scale um, model that I would have loved to have had uh, yeah. three years ago. But I, yeah. um, it actually it was a it was a lockdown project for me. Um, the, the very first lockdown in 2020 I, I spent a lot of my time building a balsa uh 24 scale bristol scout wow. uh, which 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 got used in some of the early test shots oh wonderful wonderful where are the models now um they're they're a little bit worse for wear they've they've had they've they've been through the war <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but they're, they're currently in my uh they're currently in my living room awaiting repair and and they'll they'll be put on display at some point once they've been repaired. It's funny. I was watching a, a video um, about Peter Jackson, his obsession with what, all things World War One, uh, particularly aviation, and, the, and his very early um, kind of uh, uh, experimentation with filmmaking. And they showed some film of him making the models, but also he went to so much realism. He would basically end up with aircraft in flames and so you see footage of these aircraft in flames you know being mm -hmm. by... take me back to being a kid i did used to um i did used to experiment with um planes but they um uh, uh, wooden planes going down in flames and all of yes. those things yeah i know <laughs> it's not the first time i've done it <laughs> well i should i just suggest you look after your your models very carefully yeah. I mean, given what to, you know some of the original Star Wars models now. True. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, true. You can put them safely away in the attic and bring them out as part of your pension plan. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay. Uh, a, a replica of Bristol Scout is used in the film. What was it like working with and filming the replica of Bristol Scout? Uh, 
it it, it was amazing it, it it was such a such a privilege like, like i said um david went above and beyond the help because originally i i thought that his 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 bristol scout is it's royal navy air service so it, it doesn't look the same it's it's 1264 it's all stamped he's he's got his gun on the other side he's not got side mounted gun like yes it's still a bristol scout but everything's different about it um so i'd i'd thought i'd factored in a lot of that i'm gonna have to change a lot of stuff on on cgi but um but david once once he once he'd got on board he was like no we'll we'll, we'll just change it so he he um i i I just gave more than I ever thought he would. So he just, he ripped off some of his decals and said, oh, we'll use that. And he, he took his gun off and put my gun on the side and he, wow. we, we, got, we got vinyl stickers. So he really went to town of, with making it look like um, 1611. And um, and I, I couldn't have asked for more. But then, then actually getting there um, we, we, at, at um, Old Warden Airfield and, and I just having this having this plane and being able to get the cameras and, and then the actual cockpit shots and and it, it was it was such a privilege it, it really was um so I, I post i posted pictures of of that and and you're getting all your filmmaker friends saying oh my goodness you got a real plan how did you get a real because <laughs> <laughs> it, it's this stuff of dreams to get that kind of um that kind of access to to something like that and then yeah. uh, then there's a lovely shot where um where the plane takes off and, and the camera's right behind the plane and 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 the exhaust smoke just kind of blows yeah. all over you and then and then it takes off and that was a, what it's just such an incredible experience um yeah. being there in that proximity yeah. and you could almost i was almost wiping the castor oil off the lens <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and add add to that, we also um, we had to stop filming halfway through because um, Shuttleworth were testing one of their Spitfires. Like, um, because Dodge, the pilot, was friends with David. He knew he was filming, and we were, and we were getting proper. Um, <laughs> he, he knew we were there, so he he was really uh, I can't remember the term for it, but um, he was really giving us our own private display and. Uh -huh. uh, I just is like pinching myself, thinking I, I'm I'm filming with this beautiful Bristol Scout, and I've got a Spitfire, Spitfire. like yeah, <laughs> hedge hopping right above my head. It, wow. it was just an amazing time. Wow, what an experience! Um, thank you for that, um, Peter. Here's a question for you. Um, when people think about the about aviation, in the Great War, they usually think of stop with camels. Were Bristol Scouts used very much? Um, what was their role in the war? Um, no, they they. I think like most aircraft in the early years of the war, they they had limited life. Uh, technology was advancing so fast uh, that uh, the Bristol Scout, which was designed in 1914, was obsolete by, by the end of 1915. And that was uh, the fate of many of the early aircraft. Um, the machines that, that won the war in 1918 were... Uh, <laughs> hugely advanced compared to the ones that started the war. Mm. Uh, and it's that pace of change which makes mm. uh, someone like Lana Hawker so remarkable because he sees the moment. He saw what the future would bring mm. and he was a genuine pioneer. Um, it is sad and um, very poignant that effectively he he, he lost his life to uh, the, the warfare that he had initiated. Mm -hmm. um, but when when Britain entered the war in August 1914, although there'd been a lot of talk about uh, what, what air warfare might mean, no one really had any understanding. And, uh, and it was a whole process of trial and error uh, and innovation that brought us to the, the huge air fleets of the, of the First World War of 1918, which mm -hmm. of course were only a shadow of what occurred in the Second World War. But in 1914-1915, when Leno Hawker you know, learned to fly and became a, a pilot in France, all of this was for the future. Mm -hmm. So the Bristol Scout um, disappeared, much as many other early types did. But it was manoeuvrable, it was relatively fast, and it could be modified, as Lano Hawker showed, 
Um, mm -hmm. And so he was able to use it to best effect. Uh, I mean, the DH2 was hugely more maneuverable, um, higher top speed, um, greater carrying capacity. Um, but uh, the Bristol Scout was probably the best British single-seat aircraft of its time, uh, but it wouldn't have lasted uh, a minute in 1918. Such was the pace of progress. Mm. Uh, but that was very much what happened later in the war was very much something that, in a way, Nano Hawker had uh, anticipated. And, and it's just a great pity that, um, you know, he died in air combat when he, he frankly could have, I think, contributed a huge amount more to uh, to the Royal Flying Corps and ultimately to the Royal Air Force, yeah. which is why he continues to be respected as an, as an outstanding leader. Mm -hmm. And which kind of um, makes uh, Daniel's uh, film that much more important, really, just making people aware of that fact of what you've just said, really. Yes, I mean, and I certainly think it's, it's both timely and um, you know, long overdue in the sense mm. that um, perhaps we should have spent a bit more time thinking about those early pioneers and what they yeah. contributed. Yeah. And in a fast moving, rapidly changing world, um, you know, we may have those pioneers amongst us to this day. And, sure. and we need to recognize that um, there are people who by temperament and uh, innate ability uh, have the, the chance of shaping the future. And Leonard yeah. Hawker certainly did in 1950 and 1916. Yeah. And who knows, you know, what the future holds for us. But I'm, mm. I very much hope there are people who are able to, to use his uh, example uh, to drive change uh, mm. themselves. Yeah, good point. Da Daniel, I, I note that you play um, uh, Charles Burke at, in, at one point in the film. Yes. You, you do know his nickname in the Royal Flying Corps was Pregnant Percy, don't you? <laughs> so did you have to wear any prosthetics for this role? I, I did. Um, I, I did. Eat or eat I vigorously. did have a bit of a fat suit on, yeah. Okay. Um, and a strong but, Irish accent as well. But... I did, well, I, I did wonder about that, of whether, because obviously he was from fairly fairly upper middle class stock and then whether right. he whether he would have ever had a oh, right. okay. it's probably it could have been civilized you mean yeah yeah, yeah. but i wasn't I, I, I wasn't i wasn't supposed to play him um <laughs> i i didn't i didn't cast myself in any roles of the film uh for the single reason that we'd only recently come out of covid Right. And um, I was I was basically COVID backup for absolutely every character in the film, oh, with the exception of Beatrice Bailey, <laughs> um, so that I could step into any role if needed be. And and sure enough, two days before filming, uh, our Colonel Burke got um, got COVID, so I had to uh -huh. <laughs> I had to quickly step into step the role. In. All right. But I, I knew I knew every line of every character so well by that point. I could have played any one of them. So. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Mon a monologue, yeah. basically. I was going to ask you about the other actors in the film, but I think you've kind of touched on that because uh, um, you're basically a one-man band in terms of the other actors that are in the film. Uh, the, are there any other actors you'd like to mention that appear in the film? You mean characters of, of, of the film? Um, yeah. There's certainly, yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually a fairly star-studded um, cast of characters <laughs> the original was. Um, I mean, Lano's uh, Lano's best friend at the time, who who features our supporting actor, is um, um, Louis Strange, who was in himself um, a real character um, nice. and and a great source of information because he 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 survived First and Second World War. Um, uh, an amazing story. <laughs> I would recommend reading Louis Strange I and mean, in absolute head case by all um by the um but, but equally, equally brilliant as, as, as <laughs> <laughs> um, and then and then you have people like um we, we featured Charles Burke who 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 I played Colonel Burke um um Gordon Shepherd um was was major at the time he was another phenomenal leader and and, and Hawker and Strange both attribute um their successes to the leadership of Shepard um he was 
he was an amazing um, leader. I mean, his his career was exponential. He was brigadier general by the time he was thirty one, uh, before wow. he was untimely killed. Um, and and I think the I think Trenchard recognized the the potential of Shepard and and his innovation and his his release of creative people like Strange and Hawker. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and I think Shepard was pivotal in harnessing that creative invention and, and letting these pilots go and, and really do what they did. Mm-hmm. So, so he was a fascinating character. And the other fascinating character is um, Ernest Elton, who built the mount for uh, Hawker. Um, he's a mechanic in our film, but actually by the end of the war, he had trained as a... Um, as an NCO pilot and actually became the highest scoring NCO pilot of the war uh, with mm. 17, 17 victories that he he, um, he achieved in three months in 1917. So wow. he, he in himself is a fascinating story. Wow, a triple ace. Excellent. Yeah, I'll just say Gordon, Gordon Shepard was indeed um, um, a hugely impressive individual. He, he was the youngest uh, general in the British Army at the time, and indeed the youngest, I think, to 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 die in a flying accident. In, in, yeah. in fact, um, he his loss was, I think, deep and long felt. Louis Strange was an interesting person. Um, he was famous in the Second World War for having annoyed Winston Churchill greatly, which um, which <laughs> probably was par for the course. But he was uh, involved in another innovative area in terms of uh, you know developing British parachuting. So um, Louis Strange um, was um, just one of, of uh, I think you know, an impressive cast of characters who, as Daniel says, they were true innovators. Mm. And, and although it's, tradi- uh, it's traditionally um, thought that the, the Germans were much more innovative than the British, actually the, the, the opposite is, is, is largely true, that although the, the Germans had outstanding aircraft designs and they had much better engines, um, the Royal Flying Corps was uh, perhaps more imaginative than, than any of the other air services. Mm. And people like Hawker, Strange, uh, and Shepard were very much led the way, and they were given, as as Daniel said, they were given uh, the opportunity to demonstrate what aircraft and air warfare could achieve. Mm-hmm. So, in celebrating Hawker, we're actually celebrating a whole period when Britain was hugely imaginative, mm-hmm. uh, and it, it was not just um, in the air. You know, it was for good reason. It was the British that invented the tank and, uh, and many other aspects of the First World War that were so important mm-hmm. to the ultimate victory. So I, I think it's not only long overdue that we celebrate Hawker, but actually that whole period where everything was changing. Um, mm-hmm. There were challenges at every step, but there were people who stepped up to, to meet those challenges. Yeah. Actually, Daniel. The Hawker family has been very supportive of the film. How do you? How did you connect with them? Um, they actually found me um, eventually. Um, I had I, I obviously Lano himself didn't have any um, any children, um, and there was there, there's certainly some um, there's some some of the English connection that was from his his brother and sister. Um, that and their descendants, um, but there was also the, a very large contingent from Australia, uh, which was slightly up, kind of up the tree and down again because it was. I think Lano's grandfather had moved to Australia, and um, and and set up a very large sheep ranch there, Bungaree Station. So that that side of the the Australian side are, are very um, are very keen on their um, their history and uh, particularly Lano. So I, I, when I started, when I went public with the crowdfunding, um, they, it was probably around the first, second week that um, I, I heard from them. And, and they'd obviously shared it a lot with their own, their own family mm. and, and nice. all kind of snowballed from there. And, mm. and they've, you know, they've been incredibly supportive. Um, and, and, and that means a lot to me. Yeah. Uh, I think when you're, when you're not making a fiction, when, you, when, you're, when you're making film of real people, I think having um, having family 
uh, supportive is 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 a very 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 good thing mm-hmm. I, I have also um more recently as well been um been in contact with um some of the english um family which were the uh, descendants of, of Lano's sister, I think, uh, from right. memory. Um, so again, it's it's a bit bringing that level in as well. Um, yeah. And like I say, it's 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 a huge honour, and and I and I really, <laughs> I re- I just really hope they like what I've done with the film. Um, yeah. I hope they will. I think yeah. they will. Yeah. Um, but it is important. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um, the Great War Aviation Sites has provided financial support and also. Uh, the Hawker family has been supporters, of, as we've discussed there. Um, how much did you raise in total? We, we raised in total um, around about 20,000. Um, is, is, that, is that a small amount for a film like this? Or? It, <laughs> for a film like this, it's tiny. Um, I think for a, for a, for a short film, it, it's, it's a good budget. Um, it's it's certainly the largest budget I've worked with as an independent kind of short filmmaker, mm. but it I think as soon as you go as soon as you go period, um, it's it, everything just escalates uh, costume and costume and location. Um, mm. it, it is a huge part of that. Um, I, I think I think the only the only way I could really kind of stretch that low budget to this kind of genre of film is is simply the fact that I've done so much of the work myself right. uh, which is is the only way I really could have afforded to um to do that mm. and did you did, did the money come in quite quickly or did it come in over a period of time because crowdfunding no, it, it's quite can be quite unpredictable can yeah the, the, the crowdfunding that took took about it was a it was a month campaign and okay. um it, it it started slow, but I think I think once once it kind of once it goes, it mm-hmm. people people see people everyone wants to back a winner. Um so yeah. once it started to think actually you're you're um you might actually achieve this mark, uh a lot of people uh came on board and, and said, Yeah, I, I'm I'm jumping on board with this as well. So we had mm-hmm. we end, we did end up going over our original um crowdfunded budget, which was fifteen thousand um but then the, the crowd funders take a percentage of that off um as, as well so that 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 had us down there and it was it was it was after actually after the the crowd funder that um that i was approached by gwas um to to up that uh, up that budget again which brought, brought us up to twenty thousand, which of course was which was hugely um beneficial to to the film yeah. uh which allowed us to do a lot more uh, with with what we'd um, what we'd been given, because uh, I think at, at the beginning I was a little bit wary of of um, of doing a crowdfunder of twenty thousand because I think it's just too much for a crowdfunder. Um, so I was I went for fifteen as the bare minimum of what I could do. Anything under I couldn't do it, sure. um, but I'd kind of cut off a lot of the bonus kind of material but thankfully when when GOS came in to to top me up a little bit further um mm-hmm. later on that allowed me to have a another day shooting and some more uh things later on that allowed us to shoot a lot more bonus uh, material which I think is I mean I'm incredibly grateful to to GOS support for that because it it's it has made the film better categorically um just those extra little scenes um that's that's taken it from bare minimum to what i'd originally intended yeah. um uh, so yeah thank you <laughs> no, no it's an important film and we were you know i can i'm not i can speak for everyone else here that you know we're glad to you know be part of this project really because it is it like peter's has pointed out you know nana hawker is a very very pivotal pivotal um individual particularly when it comes to World War One aviation, really. So I think, um, as, as we've heard, we I think the Society and Daniel, we both share a determination to to make this story better known. Yeah. So it, 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 I think it's hugely important that we, mm. we recognise what both this individual achieved, but also what his colleagues um, mm. had to do mm. uh, to, to win the air war. Um, and it's a story that's rarely told uh, mm. and in Hawker's case I'd, I would suggest never been told 
Mm. So, um, you know, we're, it's a privilege for us to be able to support you, Daniel. And we, mm. we were really excited when we heard about your project. And we're delighted that it's come to what, well, in my humble opinion, is a very successful outcome. Mm. So, you know, we all congratulations. And yes. uh, I believe you will help us in our, in our aims, which is to educate the public about yeah. the First War, World War mm. in the air. But also, I think, for them to understand what the challenges were and and possibly what the lessons are that have some, you know, have continuing relevance. You know, Hawker is an inspirational figure, and I, I think he has continuing relevance. So it, we're delighted to be able to support you. Hmm. Peter, if, if people want to learn more about Hawker's story, are there any books that you would recommend? Uh, well, the, we, the Society has published uh, articles uh, uh, over the years, and uh, uh, there was one published some time ago about uh, Hawker and the DH2, and more recently we produced a monograph uh, on the history of the DH2 fighter, which covers a lot of uh, Hawker's uh, achievements. Uh, in terms of Hawker's life, the only biography, as I'm aware of, was one produced by his brother, um, um, in the, I think the 1950s, which uh, drew on Hawker's diary and is a very um, comprehensive an account of, of Hawker, but there really hasn't been a great deal published about him. Uh, and so I actually congratulate Dan Lynn filling the gap. Um, mm. um, perhaps because he doesn't have the same um, you know, victory scores as later fighter races, and uh, he was prominent in, in an early part of the war, he hasn't received the same attention as Manfred von Richthofen or uh, Billy Bishop or Mick Manick uh, or Georges Guinemir to, to name some of the allied aces. But um, he was, as we've heard, just as significant and um, sadly has been overlooked. So, you know, I think it's, 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 time that we actually rediscovered Lana Hawker and his achievements. When's yeah. the film being launched, Daniel? Well, that's that's the million dollar question. Um, I, I'm pretty much committed now to, um, I mean, we, well, I'm, I'm, when I say I'm in the final stages, as, as we're speaking now, I am literally in the final stages this week. Um, so I am I'm hoping to get it available as a public release on 23rd of November this year, which is, of course, um, the, the death anniversary of Hawker, which I thought was a, a, a good date um, to release it. Uh, I don't exactly know right now um, how that is going to be available, because that's something I'm still working on. But uh, mm. what I would say is that um, all of the information will be on on the website and my social media. So um, www.hawkerfilm.com or at hawkerfilm on, on social media. And, and I will be making it very, very clear where to go. Um, composing. Who's composing the music? It's uh, it's a it's a young guy. It's Patrick Neil Doyle. He's he's Patrick Doyle. You may have heard of Sir Patrick Doyle. Um, it's his son, um, Patrick Neil Doyle. Okay. Um, Sir Patrick Doyle recently came to fame because he wrote the King's Coronation um, music. Oh, really? uh, but he's he's a wonderful composer. He he works with Kenneth Branagh a lot. Um, a lot of right. um, Branagh's films and uh great fantastic composer and i think his son has inherited some of his uh ability oh, as well lovely. um it's it, yeah he's a good he's a good chap to have on board and he's um yeah yeah he, he's good. enjoying it I, I think i think any composer must love aviation films because it, yeah. it, it, it's classical like you you're writing it with yeah. plane zooming around and yeah. it, it is I mean, it's not quite 63 Squadron, which is probably one of the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's brilliant. Um, it's the music sets the tone. Really. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, 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 it's like another amazing. actor, another actor yeah. in, in, in the presentation. I, there's, um, I, I remember when I first got the music. Um, so there's there's one scene at the end. Uh, I'll get a little spoiler. Um, when I do a little montage at the end, kind of, what, so there's there's a scene where the DH2s fly over um, in 24 Squadron, and honestly, the, the music just builds to that point, and I still see it now, and I've watched it 20 times last week. I still get yeah. goosebumps when yeah. the music, when the music and the planes fly over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Brilliant. 
Um, at this point, I meant to kind of sum up everything, but uh, on a personal level, I think I, I think it was either you or Peter was saying that you know there there hasn't been there aren't that many World War One um, centric films that have ever been made, but there's never been apart from Richthofen, there's never been one made about a particular individual. So really, this is you know it's always been about the war in you know, the air war in general. Yeah. Um, the first one, the most famous one, I suppose, was Wings back in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, and even um, Aces High and um, Flyboys, uh, a more recent one, and the Blue Max, they're all about a group of pilots, um, but never one that's been particularly focused on a particular individual. Mm -hmm. So I think, if nothing else, it's 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 important that people actually come and watch this um mm -hmm. and i think it's going to be an inspiration for people to find out more about that period um not only about hawker but about world of one aviation in general really so um yeah you've got a lot of responsibility on your shoulders haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure <laughs> yeah no interest interesting is it's also um it's the only it's the only telling of early war. The, the only exception I would say to that is um, the BBC Wings series That's in 1978. Right. Yeah, I've got uh, which, which, I, which, I, which I think did draw a lot on how, even though it's fictional, I think yeah. I think they did draw a lot. I think Captain Triggers was drawn on Captain on Lano Hawker. Um, oh, I did, particularly but, with the gun. Uh, you know, uh, well, trying well, to make... With the exception of that, certainly feature film and, and Hollywood, yeah. nothing has ever been at the beginning no. of the war always yeah. been 17 and 18 which yeah. as peter says was a very very different war yeah no you're right I mean, I've, I've spoken in the past with peter jackson about his interest in making a first world war uh, aviation film and he, he has done a, a a few minute short as as it were uh, but um you know he that's been his ambition but he's been very busy i i would suggest mm. uh, so um i think you you may find he has an interest in what you've achieved. I very much hope so. Yeah, um, yeah that, would, that would be amazing. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll certainly send him a copy of the link and who knows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Now, I think this is going to be a start of a, something big, personally. Um, I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, you say a passion. I, 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 I'm just so believed that there is, a, there is a Hawker film there that is an amazing film. Hmm. And, and I, th I think it could be... A absolutely brilliant film and and it's and it's it's long overdue